What's going on, everybody? Rob Doster here from the Field of 68. And today we're going to bring you another episode in our NBA Draft Prospect Profile Series. These are going to be dropping throughout May and throughout June, a couple a day. So if you do like this content, make sure you subscribe to the channel and do hit that like button. Anything that you can do to interact with these videos, it really does help the channel. It helps more people like you find this content. And since I have you here, make sure you check out our Instagram and TikTok pages. We are going to be pumping out more unique content over there throughout the spring and the summer heading into the 2022-23 college basketball season. Like, for example, did you know that Penny Hardaway was shot when he was in college? I didn't know that. You can find that story right now live on our TikTok and Instagram pages. The links for those are in the description below. So without further ado, let's get into another Field of 68 NBA Draft Prospect Profile. Welcome back to another episode of the Field of 68's 2022 NBA Draft Prospect Profiles. My name is Rob Doster. Today with me, I have the best podcaster and the best content creator when it comes to the NBA Draft. That is Sam Vecini, host of the Game Theory Podcast and a writer for The Athletic. He's living out in Australia right now. Sam, I'm bringing you on today to talk about EJ Liddell, your Ohio State Buckeye. He's coming off a season where he averaged 19 and a half points, eight boards, two and a half assists. 2.6 blocks. He shot uh, his shooting splits 49% from two, 37% from three, 77% from the free throw line. He's six foot seven. He just checked in with a nearly seven foot wingspan. He had a 36 inch standing vert. Tell me why I shouldn't be excited about him because Sam, I'm starting to get excited about EJ Liddell. Yeah, I get it. You know, in terms of production, he does a lot of things really, really well. The block shots, I think, give some people the impression that he might be able to slide down and play a little bit of small ball center in the way that we've seen Grant Williams play. When I talk to evaluators across the NBA, that's the name that they kind of hope EJ Liddell can be. I'm skeptical for maybe a couple of reasons that we'll get into throughout the video, but uh, the idea here is six foot seven, really strong at 240 pounds good rim protector, potential to shoot, got better as a shooter this year, although I'm a little bit skeptical on the jumper as well. Uh, just a nice all-around game that profiled really well toward being uh, one of the most productive players in college basketball this past season. Yeah, I, I think Grant Williams is the perfect scenario for him. And, and when I say that I really like EJ Liddell, I like him as a Grant Williams yeah. kind of a guy, like a sixth, seventh man, someone that you bring in that you know is going to be able to space the floor, that you can trust to make good decisions, that you can trust to kind of be in the right spot defensively, where uh, when you want to go with one of these small lineups, if, if you're playing against a team that is, uh, that, that's playing basically five guards, right? You can put them out there and switch everything yep. and feel uh, maybe not great about it, but good enough about it where you're not going to have someone that you can just kind of isolate on an island with some of these, these Luka Doncic's and some of these other players like that. So uh, that's kind of the vision that I have for maybe here's another name I got for you, like a PJ Washington kind of a guy maybe as a sure. best case scenario. Yeah. And I think I, I I think you have him early second. I've seen some mocks yeah. they have him late first. And to me, you're if you're getting AJ, EJ Liddell there, you're getting a high floor player that you know you can plug and play and get something out of at least early on. So here's I'm like hesitant because I want to talk about the positives with EJ, but We'll, we'll get to the positives. Let's talk, let's talk about why. Because if you're low on someone, I want to know why you're low on someone. Yeah. So the things that made Grant Williams special were the things that didn't show up in the box score. And I actually loved Grant. I had Grant at like 15 on my board. And he went 23, something like that, 24. Um, he The things that he did really well were the things that didn't show up in the box score. The way that he's able to just like kind of move guys on the block a little bit, kind of establish his position in a really high level defensively. Uh, his off ball defense, I thought was absolutely exceptional uh, in terms of rotational awareness. His communication, I thought was terrific. It's not, it's not EJ Liddell's fault that Ohio State's defense was not good this past year. But EJ's blocked shots, which mostly came from the weak side as opposed to Grant being able to anchor and being able to play a little bit more uh, solidly on the block against some of these bigger centers. Uh, EJ blocks didn't really have an impact on Ohio State having a good defense this year. And that feels concerning at a real level to me on top. Like, I, I think that we're 
overrating his potential as a rim protector in the NBA based on the number of blocks that he had at Ohio State this year. Remembering that blocks, you know, if he averaged, I think it was 2.5, something like that. 2.5 blocks out of 70 possessions, let's estimate it at, on a college game. That is what, three and a half percent of every defensive possession that EJ Liddell played this year. It's a very non-representative sample of his, you know, overall impact because it's only on 3% of the possessions. Uh, not to say blocks aren't important. They are, but I, uh, it, it's, I think the thing that can be overrated a little bit in terms of being able to impact uh, defensively around the rim on top of it, I worry about the jumper. Uh, I am not quite as high on his jumper translating. And the reason for that is I think he holds onto the ball a little bit too long and the jumper ends up being a straight line drive. Now, I know he's working out in Santa Barbara with some really awesome shooting coaches. And I know that last year he did the same and he got better. So there is some room for improvement, but I liked the arc and I liked Grant Williams's touch a little bit better as a shooter as well. Even though Grant didn't make threes in college, he made like 86% of his free throws. EJ's never really been that. Didn't Grant Williams have one touch. game where he made 23 straight free throws? I think it was against Vanderbilt. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm yeah. making that up. I might be making that up. No, I don't think no. That I am. Like he, he had like a 23 for 24 game uh, as a free throw shooter at one point at Tennessee. Like I think that Grant's natural touch was a little bit better than EJ's is. Now, again, EJ brings a lot to the table. I think he is a switchable, bigger player that you can play at the four and that has value. And if he can shoot off of spot ups from the corner, that has real value to get a switchable guy who's tough, who is physical, who's going to rebound, who's going to switch defensively, who's going to knock down shots if we project the shot, uh, play unselfishly. It's all of the things that you're looking for, but I think that when you start to look at the details a little bit, it falls apart more than you would hope, I guess. Yeah, so I, I think the jumper is the the most important part, right? You're, you're right about yeah. the flat shot. Like, he kind of shoots a line drive. Um, I think that he will get there because I just trust – the the dude to figure it out like so last year he went through yeah. the g league elite camp right and they kind of said like look you're kind of chunky and you can't really shoot and you got to do this and you got to do that and he streamlined his body and he came back and he had an all-american season um, so i think that he's a guy that will get in the gym and will put in the work and at the end of the day i want to bet on dudes like that for my sixth seventh eighth ninth spot to be able to come in and do a job because you're not you're not asking him to be a star you're asking him to do like we need you to, to, to do this defensively. We need you to be able to do this defensively. And we need you to be able to be able to make shots and make, make guys guard you. Right. And I think that he'll be able to do that to the point where he is a good rotational piece um, yeah. that will help them in certain matchups in the playoff. And at the end of the day, I, I think I, I've heard you talk about this before where, where you draft, you would rather draft guys that have like limitless ceilings because you can always go find another piece like EJ Liddell. Right. Yeah, up at the top of the draft, yes. Th down in like the 20s and 30s, I think I'd rather get a guy like EJ Liddell if I can, if only because I would rather have the value that you get on a rookie scale deal uh, from an early contributor. But, you, you know, to, to an extent, yes. Uh, I do tend to say upside higher in the draft, yeah. Yeah, so I, I do think, I think just betting on the kid at this point yeah. is where I would kind of be at with EJ Liddell to come in and be able to do a job. Um, but it'll be interesting, man. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out with him. Um, there have been guys that have uh, come in from college. I feel like there's a lot of guys that, that kind of get overlooked that are just high level producers at the college level that were like, yeah, you know what? I don't know how his game translates. And it just does. And you look up in five years yeah. and, and he's finding a way to like, I don't want to, he, he's not Jalen Brunson, but it's kind of like the same kind of thing where it's like, yeah, I don't know how it's going to end up working. And then it just eventually does. I don't know if he'll end up being a guy that's going to get whatever this contract is that Jalen Brunson gets, but I, I, I like betting on, maybe it's just cause I'm a college guy. Is that what it is? Am I too biased? Am I blinded here, Sam? Be honest with me. I don't think you're blinded. I mean, look like PJ Tucker was an exceptional college player that people thought wasn't going to translate to the NBA because he was like a six foot six undersized dude that, just had to play off of power and he won the big 10 player big 12 player of the year because he was just stronger than everyone. PJ, PJ Tucker figured it out because he's tougher than everyone, right? Those guys, sometimes they figure it out. I, I totally get the appeal with EJ Liddell. I just wonder if he's one of those guys where 
he's better at the things that make you a great college player than someone, you know, like a PJ Washington was, but PJ Washington was a little bit better at the things that make you a great NBA player, like shooting, like being a little bit more twitchy athletically and thus being able to switch a little bit easier defensively and being a little bit stronger and being able to slide down to the five and being able to anchor a little bit more on that end. Well, we're going to revisit this in a year when neither of us remember having this argument about EJ Liddell. I, know. So. <laughs> I, I want I want nothing more than EJ to be great. I, I want my Ohio State Buckeyes to make it work in the NBA. We need more of them. And I, I would love it if EJ is great. I just have my questions. Yeah, well, listen, this was another edition of the Field of 68's 2022 NBA Draft Prospect Profiles. That was Sam Bassini. Make sure you subscribe to the Game Theory Podcast. I will link up his YouTube channel and his Apple podcast feed in the description below. And while you're at it, like this video, subscribe to the Field of 68. We will have 40 of these prospect previews coming out during the month of May. Thank you.